from Microsoft uh, Research India. Research India. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is joint work with Chi Jin, Rong Ge, Sham Kakade, and Mike Jordan. We all know that non-convex optimization uh, arises all over the place in machine learning, especially uh, uh, applications include matrix factorization, tensor decomposition, neural networks, and so on. Right? And the workhorse for solving non-convex optimization problems in practice these days is gradient descent uh, or gradient descent based algorithms. And given an initial point x0 and a step size eta, what gradient descent does is update the point xt to be xt minus the step size times the gradient at xt. <coughs> okay. For the class of smooth functions, where smoothness essentially means that the gradient does not change too fast or the Hessian is upper bounded by a quantity L. It is well known that gradient descent converges to points with gradient uh, where the gradient value is close to zero. More quantitatively, after roughly one over epsilon square iterations, gradient descent converges to a point where the gradient value is less than epsilon. Okay. Uh, here L is the smoothness parameter, f of x0 is the initial function value, and f star is the global optimum. And points where the gradient is smaller than epsilon are called epsilon first order stationary points. So all this says is that gradient descent converges to first order stationary points at this particular rate. First order stationary points can actually be of two types. Either they can be local minima or they can be saddle points. Even though gradient descent can converge to either of these two kinds of points, they behave quite differently in uh, problems in practice. For instance, in many applications, uh, which come from matrix factorization, for instance, local minima are actually quite good, while saddle points are not at all good. What I mean by that is that either local minima uh, uh, have a value which is essentially the same as the global minima, or local minima have values which, are, which is very close to that of the global minima. On the other hand, if you look at saddle points, in many of these problems, and in many other problems as well, they can be quite poor in terms of function value compared to the global optimum. And there can be many more saddle points uh, in the ambient space. So the bottom line is that local minima are much more desirable for an algorithm to converge to uh, than saddle points. Uh, Ashton, why do you, why do you say uh, saddle points is worse than local minimum? I can construct some a local minimum worse than saddle point. Yeah, so that's definitely possible. Uh, all I'm saying here is that at least there, are, there have been several applications, in, in particular from coming from matrix factorization, where this is the case. I'm not saying that this is the case always. Radical guarantee, any theoretical guarantee? Uh, in these problems, there are, I mean, theoretically it has been proven that uh, local minima uh, satisfy these good properties, whereas there can be saddle points which are bad. In particular, in these problems, theoretically, yeah. Okay, so the bottom line is that local minima are much more desirable to converge to as compared to saddle points. And it is also the case that gradient descent can indeed converge to saddle points and not local minima. So a natural question to ask is if it is possible to make gradient descent escape saddle points and only converge to local minima. Right? Uh, in a work couple of years ago by Gay et al., it turns out that they, they show that by adding by injecting noise in the gradient descent updates, by perturbing the gradient descent updates by a little bit of noise, it turns out that you can, a gradient descent actually escapes saddle points. And uh, uh, the, un, but the result that they show uh, requires uh, at least polynomial in D uh, number of iterations for escaping saddle points. So gradient descent may come close to a saddle point, and then you inject noise. And then after polynomial in D uh, iterations, it actually escapes the saddle point and goes somewhere else. So the question we ask is if it is indeed possible to do this more efficiently without this poly of D dependence. Okay, is the question clear? So before I uh, talk about results, let me introduce the notion of second order stationary points. And in this uh, talk, we assume that the functions that we consider are smooth and Hessian Lipschitz. So the smoothness uh, assumption we just saw earlier, it basically says that the gradient does not change too fast, or equivalently that the Hessian is upper bounded by this quantity L. Hessian Lipschitz essentially says that the Hessian does not change too fast, and this essentially means that the third derivative is 
upper bounded by rho. Okay. And a point x is said to be an epsilon second order stationary point if the gradient is smaller than epsilon and the smallest eigenvalue of the second derivative of the Hessian at x is at least minus square root rho epsilon. So the difference between epsilon and square root rho epsilon is all to make uh, the units agree. Uh, it is nothing uh, fundamental or anything of that sort. Uh, this turns out to be the right scaling to look at and was originally uh, defined in Nestorov and Polyak uh, in their paper. So with this notation, uh, notation, our result says that perturbed gradient descent, I'll explain what perturbed gradient descent is. Perturbed gradient descent converges to epsilon second order stationary points in essentially one over epsilon square iterations. Here the Oatwiddle hides some log factors, including a log factor in the dimension. And the point to note here is that our result says that this perturbed gradient descent converges to second order stationary points in essentially the same time up to log factors as gradient descent takes to converge to first order stationary points. Okay. Uh, and again, L and f of x0, f, f star, all these are exactly the same terms that we had in gradient descent convergence and the Oatwiddle only had some log factors. So essentially the same as gradient descent convergence guarantee. So what is the perturbed gradient descent algorithm? The algorithm at high level is just this. It keeps doing gradient descent and once in a while it adds some perturbation. That's basically the pseudocode. So it keeps doing this gradient descent on step four and once in a while whenever the perturbation condition holds, it adds the noise which is in step three. So just gradient descent and once in a while add noise. And what is this perturbation condition? Basically the perturbation condition kicks in when the current point, uh, the gradient at the current point is small and we haven't added noise for a while. So in terms of the algorithm execution, it, fo it goes as follows. In the beginning, we start gradient descent. The gradient at the current point might be large. So we just keep doing gradient descent. At some point, the gradient becomes small and then this perturbation condition kicks in. So we add a little bit of noise. In the next iteration, we see that we have just added noise, so we'll not put up again. We let it continue gra doing gradient descent for a while till some iterations and then redo this procedure entirely again. So that's the algorithm. So I mean, I'm not presenting the details because of shortage of time. Like you can see that in the paper, but I'll give you a brief proof outline which uh, so does it come out of row or I mean, it's just a high perturbation? Yeah, it comes off the uh, problem parameters, both the smoothness and the uh, Hessian Lipschitz conditions, yeah. Okay, so let me give you a, yeah. When do you know we have converged in the previous algorithm? When so you when you don't make any function progress, that's when you know you will have converged. So let me give you a brief proof idea. So first we recall the definition of second order stationary point. So it says that either the gradient is, so both the gradient is small and the smallest eigenvalue of the Hessian is greater than or equal to this minus square root rho epsilon. Okay, let's say we are not at a second order stationary point. We want to show that we'll get away from that point, right? Because we eventually want to converge to second order stationary points. We don't want to be stuck near something that's not a second order stationary point. So in the first case, let, so if, it's not a second order stationary point, there are two subcases. The first case, the gradient is large, right? If the gradient is large, we can use smoothness and the step size uh, choice to show that we actually decrease the function value, okay? And there is a different case, which is that the gradient is actually small, but then the Hessian has a small eigendirection as well, has a negative eigendirection as well. In this case, xt is actually very close to a saddle point because the gradient is very small and there is actually a descent direction, right? And the question is how do we use this descent direction to actually escape from here? Uh, and that's what I'll briefly try to explain. So let's say the center of this ball is the saddle point. So we are considering this ball around the saddle point. And then let S be the set of all points in this ball from where if you do gradient descent without any noise, you don't escape from this set. So we define the set S to be all the points in this ball such that if you do gradient descent from there, you will essentially be stuck inside. You, you cannot escape from the ball, okay? 
Now, uh, the key technical result that we show is that the volume of the set S is small. Now, think of how the perturbed gradient descent works. So we are somewhere in this ball here. And then we add a little bit of noise. And once we add noise, the probability that will fall in the set is very small because the volume of this ball is small. The volume of the set is small. So we'll, we'll with high probability, we'll fall in S complement. And what is the definition of S complement? The set of points from where gradient descent actually escapes. Okay. So the key part is how do we show that the volume of this set is small? So this is a different view of the, this is a cross-sectional view of the same thing. So if you look at a, like a cross-sectional kind of view. So let's say we, okay, so the, what we show is that, let's say you lies in this set. Okay, we want to show that the volume of S is small. So how do we show that? So let's say U is a point which lies in this set from where gradient descent does not escape. Now we add, so W, consider the point W which is obtained by adding the negative eigendirection to u. So u is a point which does not escape. w is a point which is gotten by adding the negative eigendirection to u. What we show is that if u does not escape, w will escape. So for every point in set S, there are a lot of other points inside this ball which actually escape. Okay. This essentially gives us this uh, volume, uh, small volume result. So that's the key technical. So you have to worry about overcounting. Uh, there is no real overcounting uh, because what we show is that you have this entire line. So for every point here, so, okay, so you can essentially divide this ball into all lines, right? Yeah. So what we can show is that this line intersects this set in a very small portion. It's, it's very thin. Yeah, very thin. Very thin. Uh, the intuition is that, okay, so these are separated only by the negative direction, negative eigen direction, right? So if u does not escape, so you can write the gradient descent update at w as gradient descent update at u plus gradient descent updates that follow from this difference. You know that this difference actually diverges because it's in the negative eigen direction. And you know that this does not escape, so you can bound this. So when you sum both of them, w actually escapes. That's the... So just to recap, uh, we show that, so we know that gradient descent converges to first order stationary points. This is a classical result. And in this work, what we show is that put up gradient descent uh, actually converges to second order stationary points at essentially the same rate up to log factors. And the key idea here is to understand the structure around saddle points to see what is the volume of the points from where gradient descent escapes compared to what is the volume of the points where gradient descent does not escape. And what I said, what, the way I motivated this was actually to escape from saddle points. And so far, I have only told you about how to converge to second order stationary points. And this is what connects both of them. Uh, in particular, if, we, if, the, if our function satisfies something called the strict saddle property, which says that every saddle point has a negative eigendirection, strictly negative eigendirection, it turns out that all second order stationary points are local minima. And our result directly gives you convergence to local minima for these kind of functions. And this kind of pro this pro this property, for instance, is observed has been proved in many matrix factorization problems. And moreover, if we have local strong convexity near a particular local minimum, we can actually get geometric convergence in instead of this one over epsilon square once we are in the neighborhood. Okay. These are uh, direct corollaries once we have the convergence to second order stationary points result. So just to summarize, uh, gradient descent and a little amount of randomness can actually escape saddle points uh, with only a poly logarithmic dependence on the dimension. And the key ingredient is understanding the geometry around saddle points. And there are a bunch of very interesting open directions that this work also uh, uh, suggests. The first one is if this occasional randomness is even necessary. For instance, in practice, we would just start with a random point and then we, uh, like, yeah, we just start, so there is already a randomness in the initial point, and is that sufficient to actually escape saddle point? So that's uh, something we don't know. And the second one is, uh, uh, 
if we look at the algorithms that are being developed for neural networks recently, right? So Adam or RMS prop, all these things, they are trying to use momentum methods for these non-convex problems, but it is not at all known if these momentum methods can actually probably help in obtaining better guarantees for non-convex problems. And uh, finally, uh, the most interesting uh, uh, versions of these algorithms would be in the stochastic case, where uh, which we can actually apply to train uh, neural nets and uh, other machine learning problems. Uh, with that, I stop. Thank you. Do we have some time for uh, questions? Yeah. So in the beginning, you said that there was a method where uh, you ask you, you perturb the gradient and then in poly D step. Yeah. What's the difference between this? Is it when you add the noise or is it analysis? Uh, both of them. Uh, so in their case, they were adding noise in every iteration, whereas here we only add it once in a while. And the analysis is also quite different from their paper. Yeah. See, the, the volume of the bad points is small. Yeah. When you say small, it's how small? Exponentially small, did they mention? Or just constant? Or? It's just constant. So yeah. 